Hi, I'm Doug. I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and we want to encourage you in learning and teaching the biblical languages. Dr. Jennifer Noonan, thank you for joining us on the program today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> It's my pleasure and honor, and I've been reading your book, a <laughs> handbook of second language acquisition for biblical studies, and just can't wait to, to talk to you about biblical language study and teaching and learning. Yeah, great. <laughs> so what got you into this to begin with? What got you interested and motivated in studying biblical languages, and Hebrew in particular? <laughs> well, I, I've always loved the Bible. I mean, from the time I was little, and I've always loved languages, just wasn't always fully aware of it. <laughs> and as a musician, you know, they talk about how m math, music, and language all kind of go together. So it's all, it's all kind of working together uh, with that as well. But um, going through my undergrad, I went to a Christian undergrad and had to take Bible and loved taking the Bible classes. Uh, incidentally, and this will come into play later, I also did a certificate in piano pedagogy and also some psychology classes on the psychology of learning. And so all of that was already priming me for going this direction. I just didn't know God was taking me <laughs> that way. Um, but then when I went to seminary, I started as a church music major and got it about a year in, continuing to love taking the, the Bible classes and thought, you know, what if I added an Old Testament uh, major as well? So my second year in the fall, I started taking Hebrew just to kind of check things out and see what was going on. And in the midst of it, I'm, I'm with all these MDiv students who are like, I'm here because I have to take the languages, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm here for fun. <laughs> and I was, like, I really enjoyed it. Um, so that's where I got started. And then, of course, I added Greek and Latin and then went on for PhD with Aramaic and, and all, all the things. Um, but it was also there in that first Hebrew class, which was taught by an adjunct at the time and who was pretty new at teaching the languages. And I'm sitting there going, I think there's a better way of doing this. <laughs> and not that that she was bad or it was impossible because I still loved it, you know, and I still continued with it. But just thinking and and started working, drawing on my experience teaching piano, um, and there are just so many parallels, again, with the music and the languages. Right. Um, and, and then uh, the next year I was the teaching assistant for the Hebrew classes. And with that, um, my advisor was David W. Baker, and he gave me the opportunity to do an independent study on Hebrew pedagogy, which he had developed. And so through that, I was exploring what there was and evaluating textbooks and things like that. And it just really primed me for, yeah, I love doing this. I love teaching, but I love teaching skills like languages and, and music. So then when I went to um, to work on my PhD, I went to Hebrew Union College, and you know, who best to learn Hebrew from than, than the Jewish rabbis, uh, but at the same time was able to take language uh, classes in second language acquisition at the University of Cincinnati, which is basically across the street. So I was able to pull those two together for my, my dissertation study then. Right. So. And you talked about uh, pedagogy in your first Hebrew experience and mm -hmm. studying uh, independent study pedagogy under David Baker. Mm -hmm. Do you find uh, with other people who study Hebrew, people that teach Hebrew, is there a conscious effort to, to train people in teaching? You took piano pedagogy, which right. I assume was teaching right. you how to teach piano. Right. <laughs> do people right. typically have any specific instruction in here's how you teach the language, or do they just do what they've seen modeled? Yeah. No, not, not in my PhD studies. Now, in the the second language acquisition studies at the University of Cincinnati. Yes, absolutely. And the, but they, I was sitting next to teachers, who, uh, people who are studying to be teachers of French and German and Spanish. Yes. You know that kind of a thing. But not in my PhD studies, other than that one class with the independent study. Yes. There, there was no instruction on how to teach. It was just assumed. Well, you just teach how you learned and hope for the best. Right. <laughs> So you did your PhD at Hebrew Union, mm -hmm. and you focused on processing instruction, right? right? And could you explain what processing instruction is? That may be new to a lot of folks uh, for this right. program. Right. Um, so processing instruction was developed by Bill Van Patten. So if you want to do further research, look up Bill Van Patten and his colleagues. They did. Um, they they found uh, a number of research studies that have determined how learners by default, 
will process input when they get it. So if you get a sentence, you're reading or listening to a sentence, what do you connect with first? What do you notice first? What, and so that kind of determines what in the language you start processing and, and understanding and goes into, uh, is acquired in your language system. Um, so there are the, these series of principles that they were able to identify from the research of how people naturally process languages. And not all of those strategies are efficient or helpful. Um, so for example, um, the first noun you run into is going to be processed as the, the um, subject of the sentence, which may or may not be the case, especially in a language that has more flexible word order. Yes. Okay, so, so strategies like that. And so developing activities that will work with those strategies in some cases or train the, the learners to work against them if they need to, to notice what you want them to notice in the input, whatever your target structure is. Right. And so then there are these, the list of, of guidelines of how to develop these these activities, but making sure that you keep the learner's processing strategies in mind is kind of primary. And so what I did, uh, if you explaining what, how I set up the 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 experiment, because yes. I actually experimented with students. Right, you didn't just do research in the books and the journal articles, in the text. You did a live. That's right. Experiments. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Yes. I went right out to the students and said, okay, this group is our control group. Um, no instruction whatsoever. This is our traditional instruction, and I use the grammar translation approach, um, which is, you know, memorize the vocabulary, memorize the rules, memorize the paradigm, and then translate these exercises. And then the third group was the processing instruction group. And so they received, following the guidelines, these structured input activities to get them um, to focus on overcoming their default processing strategies, um, focus solely on input. And so the design of the experiment then was a pretest. All three groups got a pretest, all three groups got a post test, and then the experimental groups got a delayed post test. Um, and the tests were focused on, um, they had two parts to them. They had to recognize whether the the, the sentence that I gave them was grammatically correct or incorrect. So all of them were biblical sentences, except for the ones that I, I changed slightly to make them incorrect. Um, and they had to decide, is this grammatically correct or not? So that was one part of the pretest post test The other part was a production um, thing, where they had to look at a picture or fill in the blank with the correct, and my target structure was the call perfect. So just really early on, call perfect, um, with the right form of the verb. And I would give them the, the root, but then they had to conjugate it correctly in right. that, that context. Um, so the findings then were that, of course, the control group did not make any gains at all, which was to be expected. And that, that made it clear also that the tests were um, valid, so that you know, that wasn't messing with them at, at all and actually incidentally learning right. <laughs> from the tests. Um, but then the, the two experimental groups, the grammar translation group and the processing instruction group, both made gains on the post-tests. And if we looked at the raw averages, the processing instruction group actually outperformed the grammar translation group. But in um, the language of experimental psychology, mm -hmm you have to go through and do ANOVAs and all kinds of statistical tests. And through that, discovered that the, the results were not enough to be statistically significant. So I think if the groups had been larger, perhaps we would have gotten statistically significant uh, results. But nonetheless, they both made gains. But what is really significant about this research is that even though the, um, the control, not the control group, sorry, the grammar translation group received practice in producing. In other words, they not only had to translate from Hebrew to English, they also had to translate English to Hebrew, which is a form of output production. Yes. Okay. The processing instruction group, however, had no output practice whatsoever, but they could perform at least as well, if not better, than the grammar translation group on the production tasks in the post-tests. And so that shows that something happened internally mm -hmm. 
in their developing language system, in their process of acquisition, where they really acquired that form, the call perfect. It was not just a skill that they developed because they didn't develop any skills. They didn't practice it. Right. But they were able to produce the form on the post-test. And so that's showing that this processing instruction is really rewiring their brain in a way that will allow them to um, make use of that form. Right. So it's not just an exercise and just trying to just hold on to it as long as you can to the point of getting it out there right. on the assignment and then it vanishes. Right. And that, that was how my experience, uh, my first experience with was. <laughs> I would memorize, 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 and then poof. <laughs> right. It was gone. Right. And I never asked them to memorize anything. It was just working through. I mean, I explained it, and they saw a paradigm, um, but I never asked them to memorize the paradigm or anything. They just, be in the process of working with it, they were able to acquire it to right. the point of being able to produce right. it. Right. Would you say a fair analogy there would be if we took someone into, say, a mechanics uh, shop and they memorized all the tools, but mm -hmm. they never actually got one off yes. the rack and never actually yes. put it to work versus if you know that uh, this ratchet is going to do this and you take this yeah. apart and you put this back together with it, is that, that's the sort of thing yes. you're doing with the process and instruction, Yes, right? absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay. We're certainly seeing a lot of interest in second language acquisition insights mm -hmm. into teaching uh, the biblical languages. Um, and I, I guess since the time of your dissertation, you've you've seen a lot more things yes. come out, haven't you? Y yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, probably in the last ten years, and just going to like ETS, SBL, and the the people showing up at these sessions now. Right. Early, it was maybe 10, 15 years ago. It was kind of skeptical, like. Maybe, I don't know, are you sure this is going to work? But now there's this energy and excitement and people like, what are you doing? What are you doing? How do yes. you know? And resources that are coming out. It's just a really great, uh, great to see. Right. So the, the concern that you talked about the small sample size with mm -hmm. your experiment, mm -hmm. we're getting to a point, if not already there, that someone can do some further study with larger con the control group and the right. experimental group now, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm hmm Oh, uh, now, Jen, where did this lead you in terms of uh, your teaching now? Mm -hmm. um, we're recording today at Columbia International University mm -hmm. in Columbia, mm -hmm. South Carolina. Would you like to tell us just kind of, you know, you're going from studying the biblical languages to learning about pedagogy to where that's taken you? Mm -hmm. um, so I've had some experience applying this then to, to my teaching, and so I'm going to give a few uh, vignettes uh, of yes. places where I've been able to, that it's been particularly helpful or fun, yes. <laughs> or both. <laughs> um, so one of the first ones was actually in Ethiopia. Um, my husband and I had the privilege of teaching in Addis Ababa at Evangelical Theological College in Ethiopia, two different summers. So we did a summer intensive Hebrew. Um, so I did Hebrew 1 and Hebrew 2 in about six weeks. But with these students and using more communicative methods, I based what I was doing off of Paul Overland's um, Hebrew grammar, but also brought in a lot of my own stuff as well and really worked towards an immersion classroom using communicative activities, getting the students into groups, talking to each other, um, giving instructions in Hebrew, uh, all kinds of things like that. That was so much fun. And, and the students just, they were eager to learn. It was a lot of fun. They joined in, they participated, they were excited to, to do what they were doing. Um, and so just their eagerness, because Hebrew hadn't been taught there for quite a while. So the people were there, they, were, they really wanted to be there. So, and that makes a difference. Um, but also, they speak Amharic, which is a cognate to Hebrew. It's a Semitic oh. language. So they already have some structures. So they already had some structures. So we really were able to, to make things go. Um, so that was a lot of fun. So even though it was a really condensed class, a very short time, I think there was a lot that came out of it, and, and a lot of a success, and a lot of... Uh, energy and excitement and learning. Right. <laughs> you know, a lot of learning going on, people really taking on the biblical languages. And I was um, chatting with one of my former students um, in real time uh, through like Facebook Messenger or something. Mm -hmm. And she all of a sudden switches to Hebrew. And so we're starting to chat in Hebrew, <laughs> which was, it was great. It's like, yes, there it is. <laughs> 
Um, so that's one example. Um, another is, uh, for, I was asked to develop the online Hebrew 1, Hebrew 2 sequence here for Columbia International University. And through that, I was able to incorporate, even in an online setting, some, some interactive things through the, through the um, discussion forums. So for example, I told them, go out, take a picture of yourself and some friends doing one of these vocabulary items, and then ask your fellow classmates, what are we doing in Hebrew? Yes. And so then they have to respond in Hebrew, you are, and use the right form, the right verb, participle, you know, we're standing, we're sitting, you're eating, you're drinking, you know, whatever. So things like that, that was really made it more interactive, even in an online setting, um, to be able to develop that kind of a thing. Um, since then, for the residential class here, I've been working in collaboration with my husband, Ben Noonan, to help develop um, like homework activities that are more communicative for the residential students here. So looking, using pictures using um, extensive reading type things, diglot weaves, which I'll explain in a minute, yes. um, and things like that that will help them uh, get more input. I mean, just really emphasizing the comprehensible input, but also more of an interesting and interactive. So it's not like, here is the Bible sentence, please translate it into English, which is the extent of most traditional activities. Um, so getting them with pe paper and pencil to work through some of these activities to maximize comprehensible input. So they're not just translating, but they're doing, they're manipulating it. They're doing something right. with it. So, so that's one. But then the Diglot Weaves, that's been the most recent thing. Yes. I was working with the Hebrew 4 online most recently and getting them to read passages of scripture. But what I did was I took out the vocabulary they don't know and replaced it with English. And that would be what, what we call a diglot weave. So they're reading Hebrew until they get to an unknown word, and then it's just put in there in English. The point is to keep it at a level that's comprehensible. So they're not getting stuck on those hard words. So they can keep moving and have gain more input, and, but also more comprehension. And it's in the act of comprehending that we actually acquire. Acquisition uh, is... Uh, Bill Van Patten says, acquisition is a byproduct of comprehension. And so if you can get in there and be comprehending um, without getting stuck and having to look up every other word, you're more likely to be acquiring. So to make that easy and to keep it with an authentic text, um, we just insert English for the words they don't know. Right. So this is, I think, in educational psychology, scaffolding. Yes, right? yes. So when you open up a, a BHS and, and you, you say, whoa, I don't know if I can <laughs> ever get here. We're trying to lead students along a path step by step, not saying we're going to just stick you in all this and good luck, mm -hmm. but we are intentionally targeting things that are going to help you. Right, right. And one of the things I did with that, which really is scaffolding, is I created it as a progressive diglot weave. So the level zero is all English. Level one is Hebrew words that occur 1,000 times or more, right. and the rest is English. And then the next level is the words that occur 500 times or more. Okay. Like a and graded reader. Sort like of a graded approach. reader. And yeah. so I told them, okay, read as far as you can. Read each level at least a couple times and continue until you don't comprehend it anymore. Then keep reading at that level or back up to the previous level, read it there, and then right. move forward again. And so you start incidentally learning those words that you don't know. Right. So Until the final level is all Hebrew. <laughs> right. I was talking with someone else recently and how you almost have to become a child again to, to do these things, but that's okay, isn't it? Right. It's part of the, it should be something we embrace and is part of the joy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a great conversation, but we're going to have to uh, have to come back. And <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> yes, uh, pick up some more. So uh, check in next time, and uh, we're going to talk more about second language acquisition and biblical language learning with Dr. Jennifer Noonan.